You have just opened a huge can of worms, and I'm going to tell you the definitive story of Girls Just Want to Have Fun. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, awesome. But you're going to have to wait 30 seconds for me to grab my guitar. Okay, great. Rockstars, this will in fact be the second time a guitar has made it onto the podcast. Blessing offer, if you go listen to his episode. He sat with a guitar and played it while he was doing his entire interview. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Today's episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is sponsored by Roswell Pro Audio, maker of handcrafted microphones in California. Inspired design and impeccable attention to detail will help you capture a gorgeous vintage sound without the vintage price tag. Check out their beautiful line of microphones at roswellproaudio.com. Sending your music to be mastered can be scary, but sending your music to a total stranger for mastering can be really scary. Chris Graham is a billboard chart breaking mastering engineer with thousands of credits and knows how to make your record sound fantastic. But more importantly, he understands that there is one person that really knows what a great record sounds like, and that's you, rock stars. So if you're thinking about hiring professional mastering, but not sure if it's right for you, go to chrisgrammastering.com and get a free sample mastering of your song. Go find out just how great your record can sound at chrisgrammastering.com. Just click the link included in the show notes. Hey, rock stars! it's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Eric Bazilian, uh, probably a guest with the coolest name on the podcast yet. <laughs> who says he saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan and started his first band the very next day. Though guitar was his first love, he was inspired to pick up keyboards, bass, mandolin, saxophone, drums, harmonica, melodica, a.k.a. the Hooters, and even the Hurdy Gurdy. Fast forward to 1980 when he formed the band The Hooters with Rob Hyman, dominating the Philadelphia music scene for years. They released their first independent album, Amore, in 1983, selling 150,000 copies regionally. That's awesome, man. That's huge. Their first major release on Columbia, Nervous Night, was released in 1985 and went double platinum. They have continued recording and touring ever since, though the mainstay of the touring fan base has moved to Germany and Scandinavia. In the midst of all this, Bazilian and Hyman forged a side career writing and recording with other artists. They were the band on Cyndi Lauper's She's So Unusual, as well as Joan Osborne's Relish, for which Bazilian wrote the Grammy-nominated One of Us, One Night in His Dining Room. He then went on to write for and produce artists as varied as Busted, The Scorpions, Ricky Martin, Robbie Williams, Amanda Marshall, Jonathan Brook, Billy Myers... Leanne Rhymes, and many more he can't remember at the moment. His proudest moment as a producer in recent history is the album he produced with William Whitman for Dave House, Bury Me in Philly. Eric is currently living in Stockholm, Sweden, where he joins us today over Skype. Thanks also to John Fields, another guest on the podcast, for making our introduction to Eric. Please welcome Eric Bazilian to Recording Studio Rockstars. Eric, are you ready to rock, man? Yay me! Of course, I'm always <laughs> I'm always ready to rock. It's what I do. Is it fun to hear your own bio read back to you over a podcast? <laughs> I, I'm just glad it doesn't suck. You know, I I wrote it myself in about ten in about ten minutes. But but you know, you'd think I'd have one on my computer somewhere that oh somebody needs a bio. No, I, it's like a it's a mess. So every time I have to write a new one, I have to rewrite history. There you go, man. It's a sign of a good writer that you are just able to just sit down and just crank it out, you know? Uh, stories I've told a few times. So um, so what do you guys like to say about are you ready to rock when you're in Sweden? I mean, how do you guys handle that? We uh, mostly stand up and go, are you ready to rock? Okay, there, that's pretty good. That's a good I mean, way to do it. That's funny. In Swedish, what do you say? You say, new shervi or, or uh, new yervi yarnet or something, but it doesn't have the same ring. I mean, yeah. that's why so Swedish bands will say, are you ready to rock? 
Nice, man. In, in, in Nashville, if you say new Chevy, somebody else yell, jumps up and yells new <laughs> Ford. So right, totally right, different exactly. meaning. Um, give us an introduction in your own words about how you got started out in recording and music and like, how'd you get into this thing? Well, I grew up around music. My mother was and, and continues to be a, a brilliantly gifted classical pianist. And um, I, I had an uncle who played folk guitar. So I started taking piano lessons when I was six and quit when I was seven because I just didn't have the discipline, couldn't deal with the sheet music. Um, then my uncle taught me a few chords on the guitar. I learned a couple of songs. I actually did my first TV appearance when I was 10. Um, and then, so I was primed when the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan. And, uh, you know, I, I was one of that generation that saw them and said, that's me. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to do that. And, you know, I already had enough skills on guitar to where the next day I was able to say, hey, guys, I can play this on the guitar. That's, that's, can you? <laughs> and how did that work? They were like, um, well, no, I can't. Or yes, I can. Well, I was, I, I saw it with my friend Bernie who I'm still in touch with, actually. And we figured the easiest thing for him would be to be the drummer. Nice. Uh, plus, he he, he kind of liked Ringo anyway. So he got a snare drum, and um, I wanted to be Paul at first. Um, so I, I actually got a bass, but then we couldn't find a guitar player, so I switched to guitar. It was easier to find somebody you could show the bass to than you know, try to teach somebody the solo from Till There Was You. Right. So, um, so first uh, thought was to do covers. You guys wanted to cover the songs that were already cool when you started. Well, out. Yeah. I mean, I was 10 years old at this point and it's like, it hadn't occurred to me that, you know, what songwriting was. I mean, I, I knew that they wrote their own songs mostly. Um, you know, I could see their names on, on the records, but, but just the whole process of it was something that I couldn't even fathom at that point. That, mm -hmm. that, that didn't come really until, until five years later. Right, it's that but, it's that time in your life when somebody's like, "Is that wait? Did you do that, or is that a real song?" You know, yeah, say it, that, yeah, use that language. So you know, it's really cool to hear you talk about the Beatles on Ed Sullivan too, because you're not the first person to mention that uh, as an inspiration on the show. But before I did this show, before I heard repeatedly people from your generation talking about how important that really was, it always sounded like a myth. You know, it sounded <laughs> a little bit made up, like something to start a movie with. But no, it's kind of, it's it's really, kind of, it was really true. No, it's kind of like, you know, the whole thing, thing on Calvary, you know, did that really happen? Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm, well, I'm sure in a thousand years it'll be seen the same way, except we have video, you know, we have video documentation of it. And by the way, if you haven't watched the full Ed Sullivan shows at the Beatles Run, it, you absolutely should. Because not only will, you know, you see the amazing performances, but you'll see the cultural context. Yeah. You know, they were, they were followed by a... Um, a comic card trick guy, uh, and then somebody with a parrot, and then a, you know a, a woman with a banjo, and then the entire the um, the original cast from Oliver. Wow! So, so I mean, it was really like that. I mean, oh Oliver, <laughs> that probably like the Broadway rendition. Yeah, or, yeah not we, not the old black and white movie. No, no, this is before the black. Even well, and I guess it was after the movie, but it was the musical with Davy Jones. Oh wow! Yep. Um, so I had the pleasure to record a band called Barry and the Remains. This is Barry Tashin's band from that no same way. time. No way! Yeah, he, they came I to redo them. all their songs here at the studio years ago. Well, I saw them open for the Beatles. Oh, there you go. That was, uh, was my introduction, was that they got to open for the Beatles on their first U.S. tour. Yep, I saw them in at the JFK Stadium in August 66, I guess it was. Wow, that's cool, man. Well, um, all right, so let's see here. So you started out on guitar, you put a band together with the other guys, everybody kind of picked an instrument. Um, you have a long list of instruments that you've learned how to play. I noticed that for me personally, though I started dabbling a little bit in different instruments, as soon as I had a studio, it was like this license to pick up anything I wanted and start learning how to play it. Is that sort of what led you to learn so many instruments or uh, how does that play into it for you? Well, I didn't really have the studio at my disposal when that happened. Um, you know, I mean, guitar and, and keyboards were really my focus for a long time. It was really just guitar. And then when traffic came along and I saw that Steve Winwood was, was really multi-instrumental, that inspired me. I, I learned all the traffic songs on guitar and on keyboards. And um, 
Same thing with the Doors. I learned all, I could play the entire first Doors album, including the left hand bass on, on a on a keyboard. Nice. That's pretty and impressive. I, Yep, um, it, it took a lot, a lot of shedding. I didn't have much of a social life at that point. By the way, as an aside, the music store around the corner from me here in Stockholm has the Rhodes piano bass that Ray Manzarek used with the Doors. Really? Wow, the the real one. The real one that with the Doors stenciled on the on the case. Wow, that's amazing, man. Yep. Um, yeah, keep keep so, going. Keep oh, telling so us it, good stories. <laughs> so. So, yeah, so I, I got really interested in the, the keyboard thing, and um, I think I had a Wurlitzer for a while. Um, I never really owned an organ, but um, when Rob and I formed the Hooters in 1980, we were originally playing ska and reggae um, because we had done, we'd, have, we'd had a band before that called Baby Grand that had a couple of albums out on Arista, and that was sort of prog little fusion-y, kind of like Steely Dan on steroids with, with more distorted guitars um, and lyrics that uh, you, well, you, you needed at least a master's degree to understand something. Yeah. But, um, uh, you know, and this is when Talking Heads was happening and, you know, the whole punk thing. So we were either t 10 years ahead or 10 years behind. But uh, that that thing sort of ended and we decided to give it one more shot. And we wanted something that would set us aside from from the pack as far as, you know, what kind of rock do we do? And this was right when the two-tone thing was happening, uh, the, you know, the, the, the second British invasion of the, the ska thing. Right. And we both went and saw Madness, and um, that was uh, that was really a, a peak, peak life experience for both of us. And Rob had grown up going to Jamaica as a kid, so he was really deep into the, into the reggae thing already. So... Our earliest repertoire was uh, we we wrote some original ska songs and original reggae songs of which all you zombies is one actually that is a a reggae song has a reggae beat, but um, one of the first songs we learned was was an instrumental called Man in the Street, and we wanted to have a sax solo in it, but we didn't want to hire a sax player. So I thought, okay, I can play a sax. And I had a friend who loaned me a little, an alto sax. He showed me the fingerings. And two weeks later, we did our first demo recordings, and I played a solo. Um, two weeks after that, it ended up in heavy rotation on WMMR, the uh, radio station in Philadelphia. Nice. <laughs> so, you know, I, I haven't really gotten any better than then, better <laughs> since then no, on the sax. I mean, I, I've, I've tried, but, you know, that's a bear. That's a whole other skill set. Uh, maybe that's a good um, thing, too. Otherwise, you, you were sort of um, writing math rock songs, you know. Well, I, and I uh, believe me, I have written math rock. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, so, the, the, and then the mandolin kind of came uh, pretty pretty quickly after that. We had a friend who had a mandolin that we borrowed, and I found some fingerings on it, and and sounded really good. So we we did some demos with that. Um, and then you know, it's like languages. The more you learn, the easier it gets. Yeah. So from the from the mandolin, you know, I was able to transition into well, obviously you know, octave mandolins, and then the Swedish mandola, which has a completely different tuning, but but um, I'm very comfortable with, and um, you know, and uh, I don't know what harmonic. I always you know from from like the '60s, you know, when the whole folk blues thing was happening, I I knew how to bend notes on a harmonica. Yeah. You know, uh, I picked up a recorder and uh, okay, I can play this. I remember learning the harmonica on a road trip with my family, and I think my mom bought me the Harmonica for Dummies book that was sitting you know, at the <laughs> checkout, and, it, and they you know taught you how to bend the note, you kind of inhale and kind of twist your tongue a little bit, and it was so yep. it was such a thrill when that first worked. And I was like, oh. holy shit! I just I can't believe I just did that. Yeah, I know it's kind of like getting laid for the first time. <laughs> oh. Well, oh, maybe oh. not quite as good, but yeah. Not quite. Well, I don't know. Actually, in my case, it was better. It took me a while to well, really get the hang of that. But I think I, think I felt more me. I felt more confident after I bent a harmonica note. Definitely. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, a couple of things. Uh, the Hooters and we danced. Um, you know, it's interesting to me to hear you talk about this reggae ska influence, because when I hear that song, neither of those thoughts right. came to mind. In fact, the first thought that came to mind for me whether it's a stretch or not, was the replacements out of Minneapolis. There was this 
stri- this power straightforward rock thing with like the big snare. And it also reminded me, um, listening to, you know, your discography that during the eighties, there was also good music that was being made. It wasn't necessarily just, you know, like a guilty pleasures kind of, um, right. throwback right. hit song, uh, and, and just real powerful stuff. And it was cool. And, and then also to hear you talk about all these instruments, you know, you guys open and we danced with sort of the, um, the, uh, uh, mandolin playing along with the, the melodica, I guess yep. that's where your, the Hooters comes from. That's where the name of the, the band comes from, right? Yeah. Well, the, the way that came about was, um, again, we were, you know, deep in the reggae thing then, and there's an artist named Augustus Pablo, and all he did was riff on the, on a melodica along with these pre-existing reggae tracks. So Rob was curious about the melodica, and there, uh, there was a, another band in Philadelphia at the time that I was producing and writing with, and they had a melodica, so I borrowed it. And um, uh, there was another song, a song called Solid Rock, that had a kind of similar intro, mand- mandolin and melodica. And uh, we have a, have a friend uh, named John Sr., who actually was the guy that invented the Mirage. He What's the Mirage? His, uh, um, it was the first sort of consumer um, accessible sampler. Uh, the, con- the company oh, was it. EPS. Well, this predates the EPS, but he designed that as well. But the company was Ensonic, and John was a classmate of ours at Penn, at the University of Pennsylvania, and um, he had some recording gear. So he offered to record our first demos, and we pulled out the melodica, started playing it, and he said, can I get a level on that hooter? (laughs) So we kind of looked at each other and said, okay, this is called a hooter. And we didn't have a band name yet, but we, we knew that we wanted the band name to be a plural noun that was not a household object. Nice. So now, not a faucet. Well, let me pause a, for just a sec. Yep. What, were, there, were you surrounded by other bands that were doing singular names of household objects at that time? Well, there were like the shoes and, uh, <laughs> you know, there, there were bands like that. That was kind of a thing going on. Um, I mean, I but, always feel like sometimes naming a band has more to do about – we don't dare want to be like everybody else's name. And that's sort of the motivation. Well, believe me, if there had been a household object that described what we do, I suppose we might have jumped on it. <laughs> but we wanted it to be like, like a beetle or a rolling stone or a whaler. Right, right. And a ho- Hooter was kind of like a whaler. Yeah, there you go. There you go. I was in a blues band out of Hong Kong called Blue Whale, W-A-I-L. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if it really evokes a new, but I thank you for that for that response. <laughs> um, so a couple of things. So fantastic. So it was your friend that found it and Sonic. Is that am I hearing you correctly about that? No, I, he, not on the business side, but he was their their chief of R and D. Oh, so cool, so cool. We love the Insonic keyboards. Um, another guest on the show, Matt Mahaffey, his was the Insonic EPS sixteen plus, and when we were roommates, and that was like. It just you know, he did magic on that thing, and then one of the first bands I produced, a Trixo, um, the Insonic ASR10, that was like our centerpiece for yep. creating all this music that we did. I loved that, and the Z, uh, the Z, not the ZR, the ZR came later. Um, the uh, what was the, uh, the the the? It wasn't a sampler per se. The the one that was sort of the the companion to the ASR10 um, was a. Um, uh, I, I have the ASRX still, yes. which was like, I, I spent yeah. every penny on that thing. And I hate to say it, but I just never really did it any justice. It's just sort of collects dust for me. But that was, but during the nineties, I think I had the EPS. No, I had the ASR 10 and the, um, uh, was the ASR 10 the sampler or was that the one that sort of had all the sounds built in? Um, no, ASR 10 was a sampler and a full size keyboard and it had these great, you know, small room, big room sound effects built yep. into it and all kinds of oh, stuff like that. That that was that had the first really usable guitar amp simulator in it. Oh, cool, cool, right on. The, the guitar in that thing was was amazing. Um, but I used that just I would go through that into my Porta Studio. And then um, I, I promise we'll stop geeking out on uh, model numbers here in a sec. But right next to me, to my right and below, is the Insonic. Um, DP4 in my rack still, which was their effects oh, unit. And yes. again, it has like built-in 
guitar effects and stuff like that. Well, well so since, oh, go since ahead. John John uh, John Senior is actually Rob's studio manager, so it's tricked out with Sonic stuff. In fact, for a while he had a Paris system in there. Oh yeah, yeah. I have a good friend here. Boy, we really are geeking out. Uh, the Insonic Paris system. Uh, my friend Brian Carter here, great, great producer and engineer. Hopefully, he'll join us on the show at some point. He was all about the Insonic Paris system, and he really had that thing figured out, and he was making great records on it for years. Yep, it was ahead of its time. Ahead of its time. All right, so let's jump back to the Hooter for a second, and now it's, yep. it's starting to make some sense. So you talk about how that was a, a big influence in reggae and ska, and that makes perfect sense to me. And I even think of the band the Gorillas when they sort of came out with that, um, what was the name of the album, Pocket Full of Sunshine or something like that, which was, uh, you know, had the kind of the uh, dub beat with the melodica, yeah. you know, and it's, it's almost like the melodica is always supposed to be slightly out of tune for it to be just right. Right. right? Well, it, it, there's no other way. <laughs> we, we work with Honer a lot in Germany and they keep trying to give us m melodicas that are in tune and it just doesn't work. That's so funny. Wow. My brother's big into the melodica as well. He's always playing that. Oh, cool. Um, so let me jump back for a second. And I like to ask our guests on the show to share an inspirational quote as we get kicking off, something to get excited about hitting the studio. Have you got anything you'd like to share with us? You know, the thing for, the thing for me, and w whether it's studio or, or, or performing live or songwriting, is it's just about making music. It's just about communicating with people. Um, you know, people ask me, are you a songwriter? Or are you a producer? I'm a musician. It all yeah. serves. It all serves the music, and it all serves ultimately reaching people and making people feel something, and hopefully making them sing along. Yeah, I love that man quote. I mean, definitely, it's about mu making music, but for you to add that it's just about communicating with people. Um, I recently mentioned that on the podcast again. That years ago, I remember having this epiphany that music and what it meant to me was about hearing people communicate with each other. What's the point otherwise? I mean, yeah, there are people who, you know, who make music for themselves and nobody else ever hears it. And that's cool, you know, but that's, that's not why I do it. Right. Well, I mean, you know? I don't really have, I, I still, there are records where somebody sort of mostly made it themselves in the studio that I can really appreciate. But I think for me, I just, I really have this love of doing it when I'm, you know, it, like if I could pick anything I wanted to do, it's always the same thing. It's like, I'd like to spend all day in my studio with friends making music. Yeah, I, I really enjoy both. I've, for, for me, it's a balance. You know, I have, to have, I have to have my time alone. I have to have my time where I can just dig deep. And, and if I have an idea, I don't have somebody else saying, oh, well, well what if? You know, I, and, and it takes right. me off on tangents that I, I wouldn't otherwise go on. But at the same time, you know, the inspiration you get from working with people and, and God, there are some brilliantly talented people here in Stockholm. That's invaluable. And even just the company. And part of it for me is it's an audience. You know, when I, when, if I, you know, playing, a, recording a guitar solo alone is one thing. I get molecular with it, you know. Right. I didn't get, you know, I want to get a little more pick squeak on this note. Here comes the math I, rock. Well, it, kind of, yeah, but it's like painting. I'm, you know, it's really like, you know, getting, I don't think there's any less soul or any less feeling in doing it that way. It's just different, Yeah. you know, as, a, as opposed to, you know, having a room, room full of people and, and, you know, hitting record and, and shredding and wow, that was it. That was, that was the take. Yeah. They're both equally, they're both equally valid. And I, I kind of find I need both in my life. Oh, that's cool. I like that. Um, let's go from guitars to keyboards for just a moment. Uh, one of the things I made a note of was watching the And We Danced video from the Hooters. And I wanted to ask you if I spotted a Casio keyboard in the video. Yeah. <laughs> the white you one. Did. Uh, yeah, that was really, we wrote a lot of our songs on that. Um, you know, that that and, and a guitar or, or a mandolin. I don't know if he actually used that on And We Danced. I don't think so. I, I know he used it for some goofy stuff on on the album. Yeah, I know. To, I know it's there's a fair amount of it on the Cindy record, actually. Well, well, let's talk about. Um, we'll, we'll come back to Cindy Lauper here in just one sec, but let's talk about that difference between tools that are really useful for writing versus what you might want when you're in the studio. And um, 
maybe just talk about the writing process and and what it means to have simple tools or you know inspiring tools. Yeah. Well, I think the biggest breakthrough for me was when I got my Porta Studio. Oh, cool, um, cool. I you know I it was in eighty one. I got a Porta Studio and I got an eight oh eight and I got the three oh three bass synthesizer machine. Oh yeah. And um, you know, I just used the 808 as a as a as a drum machine basically because I couldn't afford a Lin drum, um, and I you know I, I experimented a lot to try to get the, that thing to sound as much like a, a real drum kit as possible. I remember putting the snare through a guitar amp and miking that, and that was a little bit closer. I remember sure. reading something, I read some article with the Soft Cell about how they actually uh, took a speaker from the snare, uh, the snare output put it on top of a snare drum and then mic that. Yeah. Yeah. For, for, for tainted love. But, oh, but cool. having, but you know, when I was, when I was a kid, I, you know, I, 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 even when I was 13, I had a, a reel to reel machine and I would do sound on sound bounce back and forth between the tracks and God knows how many generations of degradation went through that. But, um, but when I got the Porta studio, all of a sudden there was a liberation because I could, I could record, you know, a backing track and, and then I could, I was independent from that. You know, I, I put the headphones on and it was like, there's the band playing. Now it's up to me. I got to get up. If there are 10,000 people in front of me waiting to hear what I'm going to sing, <laughs> what's going to come out. That's cool, man. And it's interesting you, to hear you talk about the 808 and the way you used it, trying to make it sound like a real drum machine. I think today, um, you know, uh, I refer to our listeners as the rock stars. The rock stars listening right now, it's like most of us, when you hear 808, you're automatically going to think about, you know, boom, boom. You can think about yeah. the big kick and, and hip hop. But that probably was not, was nowhere close in your thoughts at the time, huh? Not what I wanted, but it's what I had. And I, make, I made the most of it. It's wild. Um, you know, we, uh, I know we're jumping around a bit here, but um, the Cindy Lauper record, um, when we were enlisted to to be the band for that, she came to Philadelphia. I guess it was right after I'd gotten gotten my setup, and we demoed her entire album with the 808. Um, we used the 303 for some stuff, but by then I had gotten a real bass, um, so I played that on on most of the demos. But that Porta Studio, we have Porta Studio recordings. Of of most of those songs, so and it's funny pretty- because like the the three hundred three, I think of that kind of Chicago dance music, like you know that kind of like um, sequenced bass line with filters all over it is the perfect tool for that. Yeah. But again, you weren't using it for that; you were probably playing trying to play legitimate bass lines on it for the for songs, which you couldn't do. You, there was no way you could play that thing in real time. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, here's another, uh, connection. So you're talking about using the 808, wishing it was a Lindrum, which of course, um, you know, was a favorite of Prince's in Minneapolis. Um, and then you went on to go record with Cindy Lauper. And one of the songs that stood out to me that jumped right out was, uh, you guys had did a cover of when you were mine, which was a Prince yeah. song. Talk, talk about doing that. Our band, enormous Richard used to cover that. And we still will, if we do a reunion, we'll definitely cover that. And I play the, uh, the um the line that da, 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 da. Nice. I just I do that on a fiddle. So oh, cool. I'd like to hear your version and how you guys arrived at doing that song and, and and you know what that meant to you. Well, that one had they had already done some work on that with with it, with a with a different team before they came to us. Um, so we didn't really do much pre production on that. Um, we did, you know, program the Lin when we went, went into the record plant. And, um, I don't even know if I played on that one. I think Rick DeFonso played the guitar part on that, that he had played on, on, on their demo. Um, but, uh, you know, I was there for the whole, you know, the whole, the whole recording pro- process. Um, nice. it was very, and Cindy singing in octaves was uh, just just amazing. And, and it's funny cause I wasn't really familiar with the Prince version. I know shoot me now. Um, but, um, but, you know, Cindy and and Rick had a very clear between the two of them and and they didn't always agree. There was a lot of battle in there, that, that whole dynamic, which is a whole other interview. But, um, 
they had a between them they had a pretty clear vision of what the record was going to sound like you know i wanted it to rock cindy kept saying we're not making a rock record we're making a dance record interesting yeah well it was a great crossover of those two things um and a couple of you know huge songs off that time after time and girls just want to have fun um and i remember when i came down to Tennessee and t- for recording school and we were taking sort of this history of recording and history of pop music you know i had a, a professor telling us the story of Cinder L- Cindy Lauper recording girls just want to have fun and how there was some story where you know the label took her in and and was you know suggesting songs and she saw that one and was like you know what the hell is this are you kidding you know and then <sighs> and they kind of flipped it on its head and and completely embraced it as this sarcastic um, at, you know, uh, response to women in music and everything. And I, I wonder, I don't know if you could feel comfortable sort of talking about that whole thing, but was that a real awareness as you guys were making the record that there was an attitude about that song? And it was kind of like a, it was kind of a fuck you to, <laughs> to the music have, business and how it treated women. You have just opened a huge can of worms and I'm going to tell you the definitive story of girls just want to have fun. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Awesome. But you're going to have to wait 30 seconds for me to, <clears throat> for me to grab my guitar. Hold okay, on. great. Rockstars, this will in fact be the second time a guitar has made it onto the podcast. Blessing offer if you go listen to his episode. He sat with a guitar and played it while he was doing his entire interview. All right. That, in tune enough. Okay. So Rick Chertoff figures prominently into all of these stories. He was... He was the drummer in the first band I was with, in with Rob when we met at the University of Pennsylvania in an electronic music class where they had Moog synthesizer serial number 003. Nice. So I learned how, you know, the patch cables and all that. By the way, just a little background. Uh, I was a ham operator as well. From I got my license when I was nine and uh, built built all my own gear. So I've got a Quite a bit of geekdom built in. Nice in my, in rock stars. A little background. That means he had a very fancy big tube radio in his house. Not that he was handling pigs. <laughs> exactly. And I built it myself. I built my own my own transmitter and receiver. Um, but uh, so I was I was pretty hands on with that stuff. I'm still pretty good with a soldering iron. Um, That's great. I loved soldering. Every time I go revisit it now, I realize that uh, I really need some strong reading glasses if I'm going to try and do it anymore. <laughs> yeah, well, you, yeah, I got to that point about 10 years ago. But, um, so, um, so anyway, uh, uh, Rob and Rick graduated three years ahead of me, which I lord over them. They lorded their being older than me over me for years, and now I, it's paybacks are a bitch. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> So they graduated. Rob stayed in Philadelphia with the singer from that band and wrote songs. Rick decided he was not really cut out to be a drummer, uh, that he wanted to be a producer, and he got a job for Clive Davis pretty quickly. Um, nice. His his first heroic move was he found the song Mandy for Barry Manilow. Wow. And uh, he, he did a lot of that. He I, I would really call Rick one of the most influential people in my, in my career. Um, although we haven't had a lot going on between us um, uh, professionally over the past 15 years or so. But even still, he's kind of my go-to guy. Like, is this good? Um, what would you do with this? But uh, he had just gone from Arista over to Columbia, and he was sort of assigned Cindy. So he did what he what he did. He found a bunch of songs for her, and one of them was Girls Just Want to Have Fun. Now, I, have you ever heard the original version of Girls Just Want to Have Fun? No, 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 I don't remember that. We might have heard it in the class I was in, but I, it's been so long I've forgotten. Well, it was written by Robert Hazard, who was a, a Philadelphia guy. He was sort of our rival. And originally it went like this. I come home in the middle of the night. My father says, when you're going to live your life right. Oh, daddy, dear, we're not the fortunate ones. Girls just want to have fun. Girls just want to have fun. Wow, that's kind of, um, uh, I, I picture, I almost picture somebody dressed in drag. <laughs> <laughs> like, like a vaudeville kind of, a, it's pretty awesome, though. Well, he, was, he had a black suit and a black shirt and a black skinny tie. All right, cool, cool. It was very, very new wave. And she heard that and she said, that song is demeaning to women. I will never sing that song. That's a trip. Okay. 
Well, let's try doing it differently. Let's try it like a reggae. Come home in the middle of the night, my father says. So she sang it, and it sounded okay. And then she said, I will never sing that song. That song is demeaning to women. We tried it three or four different ways. And then one morning we went in for our session. And this was when Come On Eileen was on the radio. Yeah. And who, who didn't love Come On Eileen? Right. I mean, I, you know, there's a, a short, song. there's a short list of songs that no one in the world couldn't like. Um, that, that being absolutely near the top of it. So she, we were talking about that song and she said, can't you make it sound like come on Eileen? So I thought, okay, I'll start with the beat. So I, 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 rem, I had just have such a clear visual memory of turning the tempo knob on the 808 down and changing the kick drum pattern because um, I wanted it to go like boom, but that, boom, but that, like come on, mm -hmm. Eileen. Yeah. So I, it ended up being boom, but that, boom, boom, da, boom, but that, boom, boom. Okay, I thought, then how about a guitar riff? And I picked up my guitar and picked up my Strat, my 57 Strat, and I played. That's great. Ah. Like that. It's That's great, man. I love this, dude. This is thank you for breaking this whole thing down. Keep going. So we made a track out of that. Rob found his keyboard part, which which uh, f rounded it out beautifully, and um, we did a track. And she sang it. And I swear, within a couple of days, she was saying, "You know, I always wanted to sing that song. That song can be so empowering to women." That's awesome, man. Um, you know, it's funny too, because now that I'm having the song in my head again, it's got that like ch -ch 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 rhythm yep. going on, right? And that's the ska thing too. Right. That was a Vox Jaguar with a delay on it. That's cool. Um, and then um, it's, it's funny because actually I remembered, I remembered it as being the Strat playing that riff for the... But Bill Whitman, who also figures prominently into this, and who, if you haven't had him on your show already, you absolutely must. Um, um, Bill remembered it as being a Rick 12. Because I also, I played Rick on, on, I try to use it whenever I can. I'm, Rick 12 was my first, like, my first dream guitar. Yeah. Um, so, Great um, guitar. Uh, yeah, I still have my original one. I'm the original owner of a 66 360-12. Very but, nice. Um, so Bill said, said that he thought that that was actually the Rick. So I went to the music messa in Frankfurt, I don't know, about 10 years ago, and Jeff Daking was there. And um, nice. he had the, um, he had the multi-tracks of Time After Time and Girls Was One Half on in Pro Tools. So, oh my God, this is my chance. So I put the headphones on, I sold the guitar, and damn, if it wasn't the Rick playing that part. That's great. And the, now, the, there is a strat doing the. Now, when you guys were assembling this song in the studio, was everybody sort of, did, did each musician have one instrument and one part? Or were you assembling a whole bunch of collection of these parts to put the whole production together? Well, when we were, when we were at our rehearsal place with the Porta studio, you know, I was playing bass, I was playing guitars. Um, and Rob was doing all the keys. So it was oh, nice. Really so the original demo for this was just done on the Porta Studio with Cindy as well? Yeah, actually, I think that was released with the 30th anniversary of She's So Unusual. Oh, no shit, man. I, I'd I, love I, to hear I think, that. I think it's on Spotify. Um, well, I don't know if we can find a link to it, Rockstars, but I'll try and include a link to, uh, certainly girls just want to have fun time after time. And if we can find the demo link, if that exists, we'll find that. And then also, I forgot to mention this, we'll go see if the Beatles on Ed Sullivan is on YouTube and we'll, we'll put a link of that in the show notes know, as well. I know that is, I know, I know all the songs from that are, um, now time after time, interesting, what you are hearing on the, uh, the the record, that is the demo. There was no demo for that song. Oh, interesting. Okay. That song was a later rival. Um, we had we were almost finished with the, with the album, and Rick did what producers are supposed to do and said, you know, we could really use one more. And um, Cindy had been reading TV Guide looking for titles. So she had two titles. One of them was uh, was Vertigo, and one was Time After Time. 
both of which are films, as you mm -hmm. well know. She gave me vertigo, <laughs> literally and figuratively. <laughs> um, and she and I wrote a song. It was kind of a reggae song called her, and it was actually not very good. Then a couple of days later, she and Rob came to me and said, hey, we have, we have this idea for a song called Time After Time. And they played it on the piano. And it was an epiphany for me. It was the first time in my life that I heard a raw piece of music and I knew that I was going to be hearing it for the rest of my life. That's great. It was a really powerful song. And I mean, of course, Cindy's does such a fantastic job of singing all the songs on that record. Um, but it was also one that is kind of this mid-tempo. It's not quite a ballad, but it it reads like a ballad a little bit. And even the video was was sort of a little bit ballady, you know? Yep, yep. No, it really does live in, in its own world. But, uh, um, yeah. So, but, you know, I was going to ask you, too, about the process. You know, you're, you're trying to remember which... Uh, guitar you used for different parts. Talk a little bit about arriving at a part idea and the process of it. I mean, do you do you always just think like, ooh, I, I hear the part in my head, I'm going to pick up the telly, there it is, that's exactly it? Or do you sometimes have to, you know, play it on the 12, throw that away, play it on the telly, throw that away, play it on something else? Usually the guitar dictates it for me. Uh, um, uh, I kind of go into a trance when I come up with guitar parts. My, I, my, I let my fingers do the talking, you know, like that, like the, like the girls just want to have fun riff. I, I didn't know what I was going to play. I just picked up the strat and, and there it was. Um, usually when I come up with a part on an instrument, it's, it's kind of stuck on that instrument. Yeah. And then do you find that if you play it long enough, that part evolves into 10 versions of it? And is it frustrating to figure out which of those 10 is the right one? It depends. If if that happens, then the riff wasn't right from from the first place. Like like that girls just want to have fun. Part. There's only one way to play that right. Yeah. Um. You know the one of us riff. Uh, there's only one way to play that, and no one else in the world has ever played it right. And I've heard a lot of people try to play it. That's wild, man. Um. All right. Let me see. What else do we want to? Any more stories you want to share about making that record or working with Cindy before we kind of keep jumping around? Well, I mean, the, the, you know, the time after time recording was really interesting because that was, you know, we that we that evolved in the studio. Um, hearing them do it just as piano and vocal was so riveting. I, I was really lobbying to do that, but uh, you know, Rob was no, no, this has got to fit in with the rest of the record. So he started with um, kind of his go-to sound at the time was uh, uh, Program Sixty One on the Juno, the Juno Sixty. Yeah. Which is the same sound as all you zombies, by ah, the way. Cool, cool. Um, and it's my it's my go to now using the Tal Uno plugin. Um, I, I do have a Juno at home, but why why bother? <laughs> um, plus, I'm not at home now anyway. But um, so he started playing it on that, and we needed an intro. And it's ironically ironically you mentioned Prince. The intro from that was my idea to slow the changes down. Uh, in, into ha sort of a halftime, which is very much like Little Red Corvette. Right. Interesting. You'll hear that. Uh, and even uh, uh, the guitar riff, the... Red Corvette. Yeah, it's a similar tempo, too. It's a similar tempo, and uh, there isn't a guitar like that on Little Red Corvette, but there's some percussive thing doing something like that. That guitar was m more sort of um, more sort of a police -y kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Than anything, but um, um, that one, I, Bill Whitman programmed that on the Lin, and um, uh, you know we just built that layer by layer. You know, Rob did the Juno, and then I think Peter Wood was was in uh, with, with a lot of he, his keyboards. I think Rob played most of them. Peter might have played played a couple of things, but um, uh, then it was time for guitar, and um, uh, Bill Whitman really helped me craft all of those guitar parts. Um, nice. Like, and um, and then the the middle thing, the um, the uh, where that yeah. came from is see that that um, we were working, we did this all at the record plant, by the way, in New York, the legendary record plant studio oh, cool. B. But uh, we were exiled from B at one point, and we had to go up to the mix room, which also had you know good good recording capability and. I remember Rob sat down at this tack piano and he, all he played was, and that stuck in my head. 
so the next day when we decided we wanted a guitar, some kind of a melodic guitar thing, I used that and developed the whole... From right. what he had done on the ta on the tack piano, so that's, that's a great riff too. Great. One wow. of the things I love about these riffs that you're showing us in these parts and in the way you compose them is that they're like a great part is very memorable. It really sticks, and you could kind of sing it. Right. You know? Right. No, there. I mean, you know, ideally for me on on, on a record, every part should be a voice. Yeah. Every part should be something that even if you can't sing it, you can you can airplay it. Right, exactly. You know? Exactly. And somebody could tell somebody else if they did it wrong. Yep. I mean, a good example of it, you know, that, that collaborative thing you were talking about, and as far as guitar parts goes, was, is with And We Danced. Um, you know, Rick Chertoff, you know, he, we, you know, we've known each other since, since I was 18, and he knows me as a musician. He knows, he knows what I can do. Well, not what I can't do, because there really isn't much I can't do. I, well, <laughs> me and Pro Tools, anyway. I can't play like Joe Bonamassa. Nice. I could when I was, I could when I was 16, but not anymore. Um, but uh, um, when we were, you know, putting that, that song together, Rick said, can you, can you do like one of your arpeggiated parts? Because you know, I'm big on arpeggios, on, you know, on um, fancy big stretch arpeggios. So I, um, I went like this. <laughs> Anyway, yep, that's just right. like that. So that's as much a part of the verse as the melody. In fact, we had, we had, uh, we tracked that song months before we actually had a song. We had a chorus, but the verses were very eleventh hour. Oh, interesting. Talk about that. Uh, how often does that happen in the studio? And what are some ways to make sure that you finish a song? I mean, do you ever find songs are just getting stuck because we never reach the 11th hour and finish that verse? Back then that happened a lot. Um, you know, we would, we, we would have what we thought was an entire song and we'd go in and we'd track it and we'd overdub on it and we'd usually have choruses recorded um, and then, you know, the verses, we would try stuff and try stuff and try stuff. And, um, we lost a couple that way. There were a couple where we, we just never found the verses. Why are verses uh, so hard? Well, if you don't get the whole thing in the first run, it's just, it's just harder. You know, now w when I get an idea now, I, I try to finish it, you know, start, I try to go soup to nuts with, with it. Not, yeah. not just writing a song, but a production. You know, and and I know I know this is jumping jumping tracks a bit, but the the beauty to me of the technology we have available to us now is there's no more demoitis. When I record something, I never think of it as a demo. Um, you know, I, re I I record my vocals with you know with this mic, or when I'm home with with a t with a, my my tube gefell. Right. Um, you know, I make sure that my signal chain is always good. Um, you know, I want to have keeper stuff because shit happens that first time you sing it, the first time you play it, that you can just never get back. Yeah. And yeah. even if it means changing the tempo, you know, even if it's out of tune, you can tune it. I would rather, I would rather tune a passionate, inspired vocal and, and, you know, and get it in time if the singer gets excited and is ahead than try to have somebody sing for the hundredth time in tune, in time, something that they don't, just don't want to sing anymore. Well, I think sometimes as engineers, we imagine that um, if we're really good at having the right gear and the um, you know the ability to recreate something later, that that's that's what it's all about, you know. And we forget that a musician, a singer, uh, a, you know, somebody's voice sometimes just can't even get back to that place that happened when the, when the demo happened in the studio. Absolutely. You just can't recreate it. It's just like not the, the instrument's gone. No, absolutely. In fact, on the the last full length Hooters album we did, we used um, you know reference vocals that I had that I had done when when I started writing the songs. I mean, one of them I did did in a barn in the north of Sweden. In fact, this was even before I think this was even before I had an M box. I think I had actually recorded it through a. Uh, it was I think it was this mic actually this Gefell, but I had the the, the little Joe Meek little Joe Meek mic pre nice. uh, compressor right into the eighth inch input on my, on my, uh, on my Mac, my MacBook. 
Oh, that's great. And that was Power, the, that, that sounded great and ended up being the vocal sound? Well, it sounded trashy, but it sounded right. Yeah. You know, I mean, I've sung the song, you know, a thousand times since then. It's it's We open our shows with it now, but it's still, I go back to that one, man. It's like, wow, I'll just never get that again. So let's talk a little bit about the songwriting some more. Songwriting's great. We can talk about that lots. But um, one of the songs that you wrote uh, that sounded like it was written pretty quickly, Soup to Nuts, was... Um, and I think the, the actual title is one of us, but we all know it is what if God was one of us for Joan Osborne. That's the one. Yep. Tell us about writing that song and doing that record. Okay. Uh, Another great singer too. Great singer. Great singer. I know I've been really fortunate to work with some amazing voices. Um, okay. So, where to begin with this? And that's funny. Swedish TV actually, ha- they have a, um, a series called H- a history of a hit song and they did one on, 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 on one of us. Oh, cool. And, and uh, came over and interviewed me and my wife who plays a big part of this. Okay. 1993. Um, we had been working with Joan for about six, for about six months. She was the first um, signing that Rick had to his new label when he went over to Polygram. And um, we'd written a bunch of songs with Joan and um, had a bunch of ideas. And, you know, that was a songwriting lab. That was four of us in a room, me and Rob, Rick and Joan, which when it works, when it clicks is amazing. But otherwise, a lot of the time you're watching paint dry. Right. Um, It's hard to write as a group sometimes. It really is, you know. Um, But... Uh, in the meantime, I, I, I had a new girlfriend. I had just gotten divorced and, um, I met a girl on a flight from JFK to Stockholm and stayed in touch with her. And, um, long story short, six months later, she moved back to the U S in with me because we were home for four months doing the Joan record before we were going out on tour again. And she, she had been there for about a week and, uh, she had my car. She came and picked me up at the, um, at our session and I had a guitar riff, a riff du jour. I picked up Rob's guitar and I played. Yeah. That's great, man. So I played that riff all day. And uh, when she walked in to pick me up, actually I was sitting at the piano playing it and Joan was sort of riffing around doing or, you know, blues like Joan thing. And, um, and we, we left, we went, we went back to my, to, to my house. We watched the making of Sergeant Pepper came on, uh, the, on the Disney channel. You've seen that. I'm sure. I, th- I may, maybe so. Yeah. I watched, uh, I watched something about George Harrison, a um, documentary recently where they talked a lot about making that record too. Well, this one is in particularly interesting because it's 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 mostly George Martin sitting at that four four channel console. Oh, cool! So you know, you know, a lot of it is him talking about the challenge of making a record like that with four tracks, and you know how they did the, you know, the machine to machine bounces. So we watched that, and and Sarah, my my then girlfriend's takeaway was, uh, wow, four four track recording. What's that about? And I said, well, that's what all that junk on the dining room table is. That's a four, tra- four track recorder. That was my Porta studio. Oh, record something for me, she said. So I had the guitar riff. I had my Insonic. Um, and I made a little arrangement out of that. So I f- figured, that's okay, great. I'll use, I'll use this will be the intro. <laughs> then the band will kick in. And then for the verse, I'll just arpeggiate those changes. <laughs> Okay, that's cool. And then I got to go somewhere. I'll go to the four and five, I guess. Did that a couple times. Two times wasn't long enough. Four times was too long. Three times was right. Six bars. That's good. Take it out of that square box. I like choruses of threes. Well, that was a pre-chorus, but yeah. I like pre-choruses of threes, too. (laughs) Yeah. I especially, in fact, and I've used that many times since. Um, and then went back to the riff as the chorus. Um, I never thinking about what one would possibly sing to any of this. 
Hmm. Um, and then I did a little, um, I did a little bridge, instrumental bridge, which, which was sort of kind, kind of beatly. Uh, it's, it didn't make the, uh, the Joan record. It's on my, my recording of it. My, my secret track, which is on the end of my, my first solo album. Oh, very cool. But, um, I can send you that too, if you want to hear that. It's pretty cool. Um, but, um, I finished it, you know, the instrumental thing. I put, recorded it on two of the four tracks. Um, you know, programs a boom, bop, boom, boom, bop on the, on, with the drum sounds and had a little bass going and doubled it with a, with a, with a, a whirly sound. And, uh, I looked up at her, I said, are you impressed now? And she said, well, now you have to sing it. That's and I'm like, what do you mean sing it? You know, I, I need a chorus and a title and, and then, you know, a concept and then the verses and then. You know, you, you struggle with the verses. You realize they don't fit with the chorus, so you write the chorus again. You got to wait till the eleventh hour. Yeah, you know, and then you know, it's it's a process, baby. You know, you, you just just hang. You know, hang. this stuff so, isn't easy. It's, 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 it's going to be hard. <laughs> so, meanwhile, she falls asleep on the living room sofa, <laughs> and as most people do when we start describing how hard it is, what we do, as one does. And it was, you know, by th this point, it's like midnight and my, and my five-year-old daughter's asleep upstairs. Um, but I hear a voice in my head. I hear the voice of Brad Roberts from the Crash Test Dummies. Nice. The time, and who's, you know, I'm a big fan of his. I'm, he's, he's, we're friends. And, and, he can but, sing very low. He can sing and very high. He discovered his falsetto years later. Interesting. But, I heard his voice in my head singing, if God had a name. That was all I heard, but that was enough. I hit record and I sang the song. I really? You just, you just riffed the, the lyrics I, as, it, I, as it was rolling? I, I think I sang the verses on the first pass, and then the second pass I punched in and sang the choruses. Oh, that's brilliant. And then that's basically it. That's great. Uh, I, I ended up doubling, doubling most of it with a, with a higher octave, which I had to do really quiet because my daughter was asleep upstairs. So that was done, and and I knew it was special. I mean, I I, I figured it was just one of those weird songs that I'd written that you know I would entertain my friends with. So the next day, I went into our session with 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 the gang, and we took a break, and I said, "Oh, guys, I wrote this wacky song last night. You got to hear it." So I played the demo. And I look around the room and I see, you know, Joan's kind of like, okay, well, when can we start rocking again? Rob's kind of like got that, oh, here's another weird Eric song look on his face. <laughs> and Rick, in his genius, looks up and says, Joan, do you think you could sing that? He didn't say, would you like to sing that? Because she probably would have said no. Right. He said, do you think you could sing that? And she said something to the effect of, I can sing the phone book, write out the lyrics. That's awesome. <laughs> so we did, we did a, um, we did, we did a live to cassette, live to dat recording of me playing it on electric guitar and her singing. And I, they, they, we didn't have a capo there. So I had to play it in F sharp minor without a capo, which is a bitch. Oh yeah. Are you kidding? F sharp. Uh, here. The, it's just, you know, there's no, there's no good way to do it. And there's a funny story about that. I can tell you later too, but, um, uh, but we all listened back and it was just one of those moments. It was like the time after time thing Yeah. where, where we, we just, we all knew, we all knew that was, it was, it was going to happen. That's cool, um, man. And you know, one of the things that I really appreciated about listening to that song again was he, hearing the melody da, na, 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 in my head, knowing that part, but then being reminded that it was a finger picked part. It, it, it sounds best when you hear that as the top voicing of a part that, that involves, you know, the low, the low notes and the middle notes and everything finger picked right. out on the guitar. That's where it really comes to life. I mean, you could have easily done, you know, written that with just a synth line or something else, and it right. it might like or might Prince not have had it. the same impact, you know. Well, that's how Prince did it, but no, it, well, and it's funny because it's not really finger picked. I I do that. Uh, I don't know what it's actually called, but I use a flat pick and my and my two of my fingers. Oh, nice, nice. And and in fact, for real subtlety, if you listen to the to the recording of it, 
the very first time I hit the high G, I did it with the thing with the flat pick because I really wanted it to ring. So the arpeggio doesn't start until later in the bar. I think I went. Just to really make this big, I'm all in, cool. I'm all about the subtleties. Yeah, well, that's cool because you know I had actually made a note. I'm going to give a shout out to another great musician and songwriter and guitar player here in Nashville, Will Kimbrough. Um, I've had the pleasure to work with. And uh, I had made a note that I'm alive by the Hooter, the way you guys, uh, by the Hooters, the way it rocks, it kind of, the, the tone of it and stuff just reminded me of stuff that Will did. And Will is somebody who also used to tell me he doesn't really finger pick. He, he, does it, he holds a flat pick and then uses the extra two fingers right. to pick. So you guys are all on the same page somehow. Yeah. Well, you know, I got that from Roger McGuinn. Oh, cool, cool. And, and George Harrison did a bit of it too, but but uh, I think it's a Chet Atkins thing actually, going way back. And you know, and and uh, you know, all the great country guys do that now. You know, Keith yeah. Urban and uh, Brad Paisley. God, is that part of the chicken picking secret? I think I think that is actually what chicken picking is. All right. Okay, cool, man. Um, well, let's see. We're we're getting close to needing to to take a break before we come in for the jam session. But you know, you listed some great instruments, uh, keyboards, bass, mandolin, saxophone, drums, harmonica, melodica, and the hurdy-gurdy. Um, I'm going to ask you uh, what you want to say about recording those instruments. Let's start with the hurdy-gurdy. What the hell is it, and how do you record it? The hurdy-gurdy is... Um, uh, everybody thinks it's a, like an, an organ that an organ grinder plays, and the only thing it has in common with that is that it has a crank. Um, it's actually a stringed instrument. The crank is attached to a wheel that has, um, it's a wooden wheel that ha you put rosin on and that bows the strings. It has two drone strings in octaves, one of which gives a sort of a, a little buzz when you give an extra push to the, uh, to the wheel. And then there's a melody string in the middle that has keys that change the pitch. Nice. So it sounds kind of like a bagpipe and it's, um, it's not common, but it's more common in Swedish folk music than it is certainly in American folk music. So when I started coming here, um, thanks to Sarah, who now my wife now for 22 years, um, right I saw I saw artists playing it, and I said I got to get me one. So I found the guy who built the one that I saw the guy playing, and um, got you know as, as good as I could get on it, but. Um, it's a, it's a really it's 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 a it's a bear to to record because the the um the, the keys have this you know they make a they knock when you when you when you right. press on them like now, a clacking the, <clears throat> the clacking now the more deluxe hurdy gurdies have a cover but that apparently isn't like the purest thing you want the clacking right. so you got to find the mic the right mic uh, placement I tend to use a ribbon mic on it the uh, Coles forty thirty eight works really well on it ah very cool cool. Um, then, um, as far as miking other stuff goes, you know, for me, everything goes back to Bill Whitman. Bill is, Bill, everything I do is like, what would, what would Bill do? Nice. I mean, that's the reason I've got this, this, uh, this Gefell mic here. Um, he, if, you know, for the uninitiated, he engineered the Cindy Lauper record. He engineered the Joan record. He engineered the good sounding Hooters records. He also produced the outfield He's uh, been Cindy's bass player and musical director for 15, 20 years now. And um, he just knows. He always knows. That's He's the cool. only guy. When I'm recording with him, I will let him pick the amp. I'll let him turn the knobs. And sometimes it's totally unexpected, but he's always right. And he was the one that uh, when we recorded one of us that suggested I double the chorus on the Rick 12. Very cool. Very cool. Well, so um, when you're recording yourself and doing the engineering, that might be more of the demo process for you? Well, again, to me, there's no demos. I want right. to keep everything. So I'm careful. Um, you know, I, I'm sort of Hippocratic about it. It's first, first, do no harm. I try not to do anything on the way in that, that's going to be too, too radical, unless it's, you know, it's a really wacky, cool sound. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but like, uh, you know... As far as get, you know, recording uh, acoustic instruments, I'm I'm a one mic guy. Okay. You know, uh, I, I right now you're a, sitting in front you know, of a Gefell, uh What is it? The UM70. 72, 71, whatever the uh, the uh, the cardioid only one is. Okay, great. And those are wonderful mics. I love these. These are all all I use. 
Um, so if you are going to record a melodica part, what do you have to say about, um, you know, mics that work well on that or even where the mic goes? I mean, does it go do Not too, behind uh, your you head? Know, <laughs> I know. I mean, the, the melodic is really not that difficult an instrument to record. I usually use one of these or, I mean, my setup at home, I have a, uh, a uh, is it a UM92 or U92, the, the tube gefell. Mm-hmm. Diag- I just have that in front of me all the time. So I record 90% of everything through that because as, as Bill once pointed out, why would you record anything with, with anything other than the best mic you have? That's a good point. And, you know, <clears throat> I'll bring this up too. So tube mics, um, rock stars, you have to plug in the power supply into the wall and then you got to use a special cable from the power supply to the mic. And then you have a mic cable running from the power supply to your, you know, your mic panel or your interface. And I sort of learned that if I had, and they, they all, they're also tend to be expensive mics. So you, usually it's your, your expensive, fancy mic. So part of you might want to put it away neatly in the box in the container and set it aside carefully when you're not using it. But I sort of learned here that if I didn't have it out on a stand, ready to go, maybe even powered up all the time, it just wasn't going to get used because it was going to take too long to set up. What, have you discovered that you know you like leaving your tube mic ready to go all the time? I have everything ready to go all the time. Okay, cool. Talk about that. How, what have you learned about you know what makes a studio useful as far as how quickly you can use something? Well, for me, I want to be able to get an idea down instantly. And my studio... My, my real studio, which I'm 4,000 miles away from right now, um, is a carriage house behind my house outside of Philadelphia. Um, it's two, uh, two stories. It's an, old, it's an old carriage house. I think I said that already. But nice. So, so downstairs, I have the drums mic'd up, ready to go. Um, I've got a mountain of guitar amps that I haven't turned on in years. Um, I've gone over to the dark side with that. We'll talk more <laughs> about that later. Um, and then, you know, upstairs I've got a Steinway with a couple of Gefells on it, ready to go. Um, you know, my drums are mic'd up. Um, I, you know, tweak the EQ as needed, the levels. If I have a drummer who doesn't hit as hard, um, I have my, my actually my two tube mics. I've got the Gefell, and then I have a uh, Browner VM1. Oh yeah, that's uh, a great mic. Which is yeah, I, I never use it. It was an impulse buy, and I, I like. I think I like the Gefell better. Um, but I have them, you know, ready to go at all times. Um, what um, what is what mics are on your drums? Uh, um, I have two of these same Gefells. I do the um, the sort of the Ken Scott setup. I've got one. Uh, well, obviously uh, on the kick, I have an SM7. The snare, I have a Gefell pencil mic, like like kind of like the KM84. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I'm not a fan of of uh, dynamics on on the snare drum. Very cool. Again, Interesting. that's you know that's again that's that's Bill talking, but you know when he's in the room, it always sounds better. So, what are some um, things that you hear in the sound of the snare when um, a condenser is used rather than a dynamic? I just hear a more full range sound. Okay. You know, I I hear the I hear you know I I I don't like to use a bottom mic on the snare. I hear the snares plenty. From the you know just from having a, a condenser on top, um, it's just, just a clarity to it that I that I don't get from a, from a uh, from a fifty seven. I mean a fifty seven, you know, you first put it on and go, oh yeah, that's the sound. But when you start mixing it in, you to me to my ears, it just kind of sounds wanky, and that's when I start going for the triggers. Right, or you just have to keep boosting the high frequencies because it's yeah. not bright enough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, are you often putting a pad of some sort on the mic on that condenser mic that's on the snare? Is that an yeah. issue that you have to deal with? Well, that mic doesn't have a pad on it, which is the only thing. But I find that um, uh, I, I get by. I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm using. I'm, I'm all daking for my for my uh, my inputs. So I have okay, a, cool. And I have six channels of dedicated. Another baking. Philly cat, or pretty close to Philly, right? Wil- Wilmington, yeah. Wilmington, yeah. So um, I use his. I have uh, six channels of his uh, mic pre EQs, the, the first generation, the vertical ones that he mm-hmm. made. And those are, you know, with the pad on that, I'm able to get by with the, with the snare. Um, uh, so those are those are those go untouched. Those are my for my drums. Um, then. Um, for a long time I was, I, I was using my two coals sort of as near room mics 
and then miking the toms with with two of the um the um 72s or 71s whatever it is um but then bill kind of turned me on to the the ken scott thing of having uh, one mic sort of facing across the the floor tom pointed mm-hmm. at the snare and then one kind of across the uh, the rack tom pointed at the snare and really i get most of my drum picture just from those two mics yeah yeah i like recording that way doing the minimal thing and then if the you know if the drummer hits evenly you're okay and now with you know with clip gain and pro tools for if i want to if i want to gain a tom fill up i gain the tom fill up yeah yeah, um, and cool. then, and then I, you know, I have the two coals out in the room. Um, uh, another trick I learned from Bill is I have them pointed, I have them pointed uh, vertically, so I'm getting the reflections from the floor and ceiling, and not as much of the, of the direct signal. Ah, uh, that's cool. Yeah, uh, Brian Carter, another shout out to you. That was my friend who did the Insonic Paris system. He introduced me to that uh, for the first time ever. It was two ambient mics out in front of the drums in figure eight, just pointing up and down, yep. not towards the kit. Yep. And, you know, sometimes I do that. Sometimes I turn them to face the kit. It's kind of like whatever I feel like at the time. And if it sounds good, it is good. Yeah, totally. Well, very cool. Um, and then um, quickly, uh, what about mixing? What does that mean to you? How do you like to approach a mix these days? Well, I, I'm, I'm of the mix-as-you-go um, school. You know, I try, just want it to sound good all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, I just keep trying to make it all sound better. You know, I, at, at home, I work on HDX, so latency isn't so much of an issue. Yeah. So if I want to overdub something, all I got to do is, is um, deactivate whatever n- nasty tape stuff I've got on the, on the, um, on the output, output bus. By the way, my mix bus, I, I, I also use um, Daking for. I have not found a hardware compressor that does what the Daking compressors do. Very cool. Um, what is that? Is there a particular model that you really like? Well, he only makes one. Okay, there you go. <laughs> well, well, I think now he actually makes a stereo version of the one I, of the ones I have. I actually have his two first generation ones, and um, you know, I just have him set sort of like a Compex with the auto release. Um, nice. The uh, the the Slate FGX does a pretty good job of that actually, and then there's a plus ten plus ten dB does a model of a um, of a Compex that's pretty good. That's right. I remember um, I remember hearing all about that one. I hadn't used it yet. But again, you know what? People that I work with, they do the, you know, I, you know, I set with really fast attack, auto release and not, don't hit it too hard. You know, I see people doing it totally opposite with a slow, slow attack, quick release, and it sounds great. Yeah. I think there are a lot of ways to, you know, skin a cat, you know, <laughs> sorry, but, sorry, what, no offense what, to cats. I just, uh, but like it's, a, it's a mixing, it's hard mixing. Like sometimes people will bring stuff to me and ask me to mix it, which is like, really? Um, but the first thing I do is I take off all the plugins. Yeah. Because uh, I want it, because, you know, people, you know, they'll have three compressors and two EQs on something. And I'm like, what does it sound like? And uh, I remember one, one, one guy in particular was amazed. He came back and he said, oh, my God, that sounds great. And I showed him that there were like no plugins on anything. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this question. So you, you talk about mixing as you go. Uh, do you still find that, the overdub that you're working on now tends to need to be loud in the track to be able to do it. And do you then turn it back down to sit it in the track? What does that mean to you? Do you recognize that kind of um, dynamic of making things loud and then making it sit oh, in the yeah. mix again? Like, how do we deal with that? Oh, yeah. I routinely will pull an overdub down 3 dB. When it's, you know, when, when I, once I've done it. Yeah. I mean, of course, I know I'm especially if it's a vocal. Yeah. You know, um, cause I, you know, I want to hear, although I've gotten more and more accustomed to singing as though I'm just, or playing with the record, you know, I play, you know, playing it where it's going to end up. Yeah. I feel like I get, I get a different vibe that way. Um, I'm, I'm actually the same way with my, um, my in ears when I play live with the Hooters, um, everyone else in the band, you know, they'll hear, like the bass player hears kick drum, bass, and maybe some vocals. Um, I I want a mix that sounds like a record with you know with just a little more me. Yeah, I feel like that's a, a confidence level that you work toward in the studio. You know, um, and I know there's so many times where you know maybe I get up a sound for somebody else, and I, if I sit it where I think it might live in the mix, um, sometimes you know their response is like I. 
I can't even hear it. Or can you turn it up? Cause I can't figure out my part. And then, right. you know, mm-hmm. sometimes get a little frustrated and you're like, well, maybe it's not the right part. And, and that's, you know, most of the time they're just right. Cause they're playing the instrument yeah. and they know what yep. they need to hear. Yeah. I mean, yeah, again, it depends, it depends on what you're doing. But yeah. I, I, especially if I'm playing like a rhythm guitar, I need to, can't be too loud because I got to hear the groove, but I, you know, I, I need to know when I'm getting ahead or, or getting behind. Cool. Um, um, you know, the one, probably the biggest limitation I have is the fact that I, I know I've suffered a good bit of hearing loss over the years. Um, right. I was just, I mean, I on loud su- stages, it's kind of, it comes with the territory. Yeah. And really, I think I probably suffered the most of it in, in the seventies before you had good, good monitor systems. And, and, you know, when I first started gigging, the guitar amps weren't even in the PA. Right. So I'm, you know, I'm playing a Marshall stack so I can get heard in the back of the room. You know, I, I went to a lot of shows in the, in the late sixties. Uh, there was a place called the electric factory in Philly. Uh, there is one now, but it's not the same place. Mm-hmm. And I, I went, I saw the who there. I was right in front. I've wow. got amazing pictures from that. In fact, I'm doing, I'm doing an exhibition here. Uh, next year on, uh, with, with those. I have met photos from 69. I have the Who. I've got the Stones, Hendrix, crazy stuff that's just been sitting in, 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 in a drawer somewhere. But, cool. um, but I saw the Who. I saw six shows of the Who from, you know, 15 feet away from his three high watts. So I bet it was a little loud right where you were. It was a little loud. So I definitely gave up some, some, some of my high end to that. So I'm, I'm always second guessing myself as far as EQ. Because I can crank that 10K and crank that 10K and I won't hear any of it. Yeah. Um, and then as a kid, I'm guessing you probably were like earplugs. You know, to hell with that. I, it doesn't sound right to me. You know, I don't know if you wore earplugs at the time, but I remember it was a real challenge for me to get used to it. Once I got used to earplugs, now if I go to a show, I don't enjoy it unless I have foam earplugs stuffed in my ears, you know. But – um you know, I encourage anybody who's young listening to this show right now to just don't even worry about all the fancy kinds of earplugs that you can get and everything else. If you want, that's great. But a pair of foam earplugs, nothing beats it for cutting volume level at a live show. And the sooner you get used to it, the sooner you'll actually really begin to like that sound. Absolutely. And and in a pinch, toilet paper wet works really well yeah just watch out all right in hong kong i went preferably to not show. preferably not used i went to yeah really i went to a show um when i was playing in a band in hong kong with my brother and and um we didn't have any earplugs and so i took toilet paper and it was a little bit balled it up yep. stuck it in there needed some more balled it up stuck it in there needed some more balled it up. So at the end of the night i couldn't get it out and I actually had to go up to the emergency room the next day oh. and have them extract the toilet paper from my ears. So ah. watch out for that one. Yeah. Um, all right, yeah. rock stars, we're going to take a break now, and we'll come back in a moment for the jam session. Um, I've, I'll have links to all this awesome stuff Eric is sharing with us in the show notes. If you're on your mobile device, just open the podcasting app. should be right there. You can just click through, scroll through with your finger, and uh, click on any one of those links. You can go over to the blog post at rsrockstars.com and then search Eric um, or just click through for the full show notes from your mobile device. We'll see you guys in a moment for the jam session. Roswell Pro Audio brings you microphone design that is out of this world. Endorsed by a growing list of artists and producers like Phil Collin of Def Leppard, Ross Hogarth, who's recorded Van Halen, Ziggy Marley, and the Doobie Brothers, and Super Dupes, working with Drake, Mary J. Blige, and Eminem. These are all rock stars that have discovered just how great Roswell microphones sound. Check out the Mini K47, which uses a capsule modeled on the one in the vintage U47 at a street price of only $299. Or the beautiful Delphos condenser microphone with a capsule tuned like the vintage U67 with great clarity and far lower noise at a street price of only $899. In fact, you are hearing my voice right now on the beautiful Delphos microphone. These mics are carefully crafted by hand and immediately feel good even before you plug them in and hear how great they sound. These are well-built microphones that will last you and your studio a lifetime of great recording. Check out more audio examples of these awesome mics at roswellproaudio.com. Are you having trouble getting your mixes to sound professional? Are you mixing and mastering yourself? Did you know that the vast majority of the world's best mix engineers almost never master their own mixes? So if you're thinking about hiring a professional mastering engineer, 
Check out Chris Graham Mastering. Chris is a Billboard chart-breaking mastering engineer who has mastered thousands of songs for both professional and home studio clients just like you. Send one of your songs to Chris and he'll master a sample of your song for free. If you decide to hire him, you can also get a free video mix consultation before mastering to help you get the most out of your mix. To learn more, check out chrisgrammastering.com or just click the link in the show notes. Hey, rock stars, Lid Shaw, welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars. We're going to jump into the jam session. My guest today is Eric Bazillion. Once again, that's Bazillion as in a whole lot and one of the coolest names on the podcast. Um, Eric, welcome back. Are you ready to jam? I am so ready to jam. Always ready to jam. Awesome, dude. And you've even got your guitar with you, which is, makes it extra special. Stump the band. All right. So when you started out in recording, what was holding you back? Um, there just wasn't a whole lot available to con at a consumer level. You know, I started uh, 69, 70. Um, I believe TIAC had started making a four track for home use. That was something like $3,000, which at the time was like, you know, 50,000 now. Right. So I had an Ampex. Somehow I found an, you know, an Ampex two track that I could do sound on sound with and bounce back and forth. But you know, you just didn't have the um, the, uh, the availability of, of the gear then. So yeah. it wasn't until it wasn't until the Porta Studio happened that you know you, you, a guy like me could do anything. Um, which came first, the Porta Studio or the Porta Potty? Uh, uh, the Potty, definitely. The Potty. <laughs> I wonder if anybody realized that as they were thinking of a name for the Porta Studio, but yeah. it didn't seem to stop any of us from from uh, getting one and loving it. Yeah, it was amazing, you know. And you know, I had one. I had a. I think I had a '58, and I remember, you know, trying to record drums with with that. You know, yeah. putting a '58. Where Where am I going to put the mic? Where did you put it when you had one mic? <laughs> no idea. No idea. No, my my buddy had a four track, and he did more recording of drums with his. And I remember the same thing. He would sort of stick his 58 just out in front of the kit. And somehow when he did it, it always sounded cool as shit, you know? You know, I, I've gone back and listened to some of those recordings, and they sound pretty good. Yeah. There's a, there's like a, a a cool, almost a bit of distortion and um, harmonic saturation and everything that happens in those four-track recorders. Plus, you get the limiting of the tape and all that, which is kind of... Yep. Made it all more listenable. Well, so I wish uh, yeah. I, I just wish I had known about compressors then. Oh I kept yeah. Thinking, you know, why doesn't my voice sound good? Well, a because it doesn't. But um, you know, it wasn't until I sang in a in a real studio and I wow, wow, I sound great. What, what are you doing to me? And I saw the they had an LA two A over there that was pinning right. it. And like, That's what's missing. That is a great sound, an LA two A with the pin <laughs> all the way down. <clears throat> Well, so now, how about some of the best advice you received? Um, well, you know, use your ears. That's one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, no, no truer words than these. Um, kind of the less is more thing. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, I got that. I got a lot of that from you know from Bill from Bill Whitman. When, you know, recording guitars. Some people have five mics in the room. He's like. <clears throat> Get one good mic, put it in in one good place, no face issues. You're just that's what the guitar sounds like. Yeah. No, I'm um, with you on that. I, I've tried a multiple of ways to record with many mics, blending mics, you know, checking the phase on them or just a single mic. And I, I often come back to that one mic and I'm just like, why does this one just sounds focused, you know? I mean, I guess you know, my one bit of advice would be first do no harm. Yeah. Just try to get as accurate a representation of what the sound is as you can and and work with that you know if you need to compress it more compress it more you need to eq it eq it eric how about sharing a recording tip hack or secret sauce something that the rock stars could use on their next session today you know i was thinking about that from from your questionnaire and like uh 10 years ago i definitely had a secret sauce um uh, when I first got Pro Tools, guys, more like 20 years ago, there was a company called DAD, D A D, mm -hmm. no, uh, D D U Y, uh, oh, which yeah. still exists actually. Do you know them? And they had, there was a uh, plugin called the DAD Tape, 
And um, mm-hmm. I was I was working in Pro Tools for the first time. I was working with Desmond Child at his studio in Miami. And Charles Dye had this plug-in that he swore by. And it was the first time I'd heard digital recordings sound like analog. So for a while, I used that on everything. Literally every track had that. I had that on the mix bus. That was my secret sauce. Now, since then, the converters have gotten a lot better. Um, there are tons of other you know, saturation, a- analog tape plugins that sound great. But I do go back to that occasionally. There was a long time when, when they didn't have a 64-bit version working. Mm-hmm. But uh, that's that definitely, of, of all those t- you know, tape plugins, that, that's a really good one. Well, there's also a thing that accompanies that, which is a mentality in the studio that says, at the point at which you have tools that can make a great record, sometimes it leaves you scratching your head as to why you need to upgrade and switch to something else because you're yeah. like, you know... This I made a great record with this. Do I really need to reinvent the way that I make records? What do you, you think know, about that? You know, once in a while, I want to restore a session from, you know, that I did in Pro Tools 7. And, you know, I, I have them all stored on DDS3 drives because, you know, hard disk space was expensive then. And, you know, I'll, I'll restore it. I can't open it. Um, I can't even open them now because they're, they're all SD2 files and Pro Tools 11 or uh, Pro oh. Tools. So I thank I God. I did that I, recently I, too. I fortunately I keep you know I keep one drive with with ten on it so I can at least convert them. But you know there are plugins that 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 uh, don't come up that sounded great. Yeah. You know, and I listen to the to the to those records I made and it's like you know I don't know if I, I don't know if I've actually gotten better since then. Yeah. You know, I, you know, then I, you know, you had the Renaissance plugins and the, you know, the stock digi and, you know, now I look you know, I, I open up my, 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 uh, compressor menu. There's like, how many, how many 1176s do you need? <laughs> well, rock stars, I feel like the real takeaway from this story is being aware that whatever you have now is the new thing compared to that old thing, but give it five years and it's going to be the old thing compared to the new thing. And a great way to handle that is to get into the habit of finishing out a record and processing all the individual tracks in your session so that they're printed with all those effects and sounds on them or printing stems so that when you come back to recall that stuff later on down the road, all you have to do is just pull those wave files in and go from there. I think it was Steve Walsh on the podcast years uh, or last year, uh, many episodes ago, where he talked about being able to do that because especially in his world, he's doing a lot of um, jingles, you know, a lot of um, sync pieces, instrumental, where, yeah, definitely somebody's going to say, hey, I need that thing from mm-hmm. two years ago mm-hmm. that you did. And we just want to like, you know, remove this one part from it and, and give us a new mix of it. Right. right. So you got to make that really easy. Yep. Yep. No, and especially now, you know, in, well, Pro Tools and <clears throat> Logic, um, you know, it's easy enough to freeze and commit everything to audio. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that was a big improvement. Good um, advice. Now, another thing we haven't, we haven't uh, talked about, which is fairly dominant in my life, as I, I did mention uh, the fact that I have all these beautiful vintage amps in my studio that mm-hmm. I haven't turned on here. I have completely gone over to the dark side. Okay. So this, I'm guessing that this might answer my next question, which is a, tell us about a favorite hardware tool, which is maybe a software tool. Maybe it's both in one. You're going to talk about, uh, in the box guitars. Well, yeah. I mean, well, yes, in the box guitars. Absolutely. And all of those plugins are great. Um, I like the 11 a lot. I love that when it came out. I mean, I liked amp farm, but I could always kind of tell, that it wasn't real. Eleven took just gave it a dim- dimensionality that was that was had been lacking. Guitar rig is amazing because I just like to go through presets and I land on shit that I would never have thought of doing yeah, myself. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the thing, the real game changer for me, both in the studio and live, was the Kemper. Right. Tell us about the Kemper. I've, people talk about that. I haven't used one yet. Well. Um, what the Kemper does is basically uh, it captures your amp. Um, you put a mic in front of the amp. Uh, the mic goes into the through your signal chain into the Kemper. The Kemper sends a series of random 
noises that make the amp sound like it's going to explode. Um, then you play your guitar through the amp and with, again, in, you know, back into the camper to refine the sound. And you basically have your amp captured. Now, do you have to choose which mic you're going to mic the your your real amp with to measure it with the Kemper, or is that does it bypass even the microphone somehow? Well, oh no, you 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 record it with a mic. But That's I mean, like, do you, you have to it, choose an SM57 versus something else? Oh yeah, you choose the mic that you want the sound of. Okay, so you pick the mic that you would have recorded with in the studio in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. That's the sound I want. I mean, a lot of it for me was like playing Hooter songs that we recorded, you know, 35 years ago, well, 30 years ago, I want to, pl- I want the same sound I had then. Now, um, I don't even have the Marshalls I used on Nervous Night anymore. Um, the, I still have the Vox I used. So, and, and you know, that Vo- I'm not taking that Vox on the road with me. Um, so I put uh, uh, the same FET 47 in front of that, that we recorded it, recorded it with, um, through uh, you know the day king Mm -hmm. and and played profiled it with the same guitar i used on those records so when i go out and play live i'm playing the same guitar through the same amp that i made that record with now you wouldn't put the compressor in the chain though right you know i haven't tried that um they they recommend against it yeah because i don't think it can replicate compression i think it just picks up on the tone and the eq curve at all it picks up on everything. And then, and the cool thing about it is once you have it, you have all these parameters you can adjust later. Um, like, you know, I, I, I profile my amps kind of at the sweet spot where it's starting to break up, but it's not really singing. Mm-hmm. But if you turn, if you turn the gain up on the Kemper, it's like turning up the volume on the Vox. That's wild. And you can even adjust it the, the, with the, um, uh, the tube character parameter, whether it's going to be, like power amp saturation or power tube hat saturation or preamp tube saturation. Yeah, because those are two totally different things. And Rockstars, right. if you're not familiar with that yet, it's that difference in distortion you'll hear if you take the main volume output of the amp and crank it way up versus the input volume versus you know the, the gain on a pedal going into the amp. All different right. distortions. Exactly. And the thing for me is I've never been a fan of, of gain pedals to me, a gain pedal is just what you use when you want to practice Hendrix without waking mom. Right. Well, it's pretty good for indie rock, though. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah, I mean, the, it's an effect. I mean, you, you know, the, the, you can get sounds out of that that you can't get out of an amp. But for me, it was always just trying to get the sound of an AC30 or you know, on 8 or a you know, Plexi on 10. Yeah, very um, cool. So now, you know, even if I profile the amp at 5, I can make it sound like it's that same amp at 10. That's pretty wild, man. Um, and then the Kemper is also a great tool for taking on the road because it's, it's recallable, it's well-built, it's solid, and it's reliable. It's awesome. I don't even take a, take a Kemper on the road with me. When we toured Germany, I rent a Kemper. I email my backup to my, to my tech over there. And when <laughs> I, I show up at, at Soundcheck, it's already in. That's great. I love it, man. That's a lot. It's a lot harder for um, the airline companies to drive a forklift through your emailed Kemper yeah. backup than it is through, <laughs> yeah. through your actual amp. Well put. I mean, you know, yeah. There's nothing like being in the room with with your old tube amp and 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 sh- shredding. But once you put a mic on it and put it in a mix. It is literally the same thing. That's really wild. That's cool. All right. Now, how about, um, I think that kind of covers us for hardware and software tools. How about a resource or advice for the business side of making records for a living? If people want to do this for more than just a hobby, what do you want to tell them? Get a job. Okay. All right. <laughs> what is, what's that? <laughs> I mean, yeah. You know, at, at this point, it's, it, it really is the wild west out there. And and my son is twenty. He wants to he wants to do it. And I don't know what to tell him. You know, just you know, write better songs. I mean, I, ultimately, at this point, I think if you write a song that's as that will make the whole world sing, it will find its way. Yeah. But but you know, it used to be you had a band, you wrote some songs, you you went out and played. You know, we played five nights a week at bars. Um, we did a residency at this club in Philly every Monday for six months, built up our following, did an indie record, 
but and we had the support of local radio um but you know the competition then was a hundredth of what it is now yeah you know a 12 year old can sit with garage band and make something that sounds like a record and they do and they many of them do so you know at this point you've got to write a song you've got to have something to say and you've got to have a way to say it you know um i'd like to think that if somebody wrote a song as good as time after time or one of us right now if they were to record it as a phone memo with an acoustic guitar or a piano that that song would be a hit that's cool well that's certainly I, that's inspiring to think like that it certainly doesn't make the journey any easier but it probably makes it more satisfying because it's a lot of fun to look back on your time and energy spent and think about how you were you know always trying to be creative and, and create a great song. Well, it is a journey. That's the thing. There is no destination. You know, there are markers along the way. You know, the first time you hear yourself on the radio, the first time you see yourself on the charts, the first time you write a song that you know is great, even if nobody ever hears it, um, you know, certain gigs, but it is a journey. And I have no idea where mine's going to go. I mean, I've been on my, I've been on this for 50 years which is unfathomable because wow. I still feel sick. I feel like a 16 year old. Nice. I always say that music is good at keeping people young. Man, I saw the stones last week. Oh my God. Mix like a 14 year old. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome, man. I have never seen them play it. I would love to, but I, I keep hearing people talk about pe seeing a stones concert and that these guys are just up there just rocking, you know? Oh, and, it's, and it's amazing. And like during sympathy for the devil, Keith was doing a solo. He got completely lost. You know, the band goes from the E to the B to the B major. Keith's like riffing an E and all of a sudden he realizes, oh shit, I just <laughs> fucked up. And you just see him drop his hands and start laughing. And then he starts playing again. That's great. That's the way to do it. That's the way to handle mistakes on the stage and in the studio. It's supposed to be fun, right? It, it has to be fun. If it's not fun, do something else. It's just about making music. I think that was what yep. you started this podcast with. Yep. Oh, by the way, that vocal that I was talking about that that, that we kept from the the the, the, bar, the uh, barn demo that was "I'm Alive." Oh, cool! Right on. And and the guitar solo that was that was amplitude. Very cool, man. I, I guess uh, might as well ask you now, uh, even though we're we're going for a long stretch here. I had written down a question to ask you for the I'm Alive video that you guys did. How'd you guys make that video? It was pretty cool. It looked like you had sort of crowdsourced the video yeah, content. Yeah, we were, we were pretty early on in that. Um, there's a, uh, there was a, uh, a guy in, in Germany, actually a couple of guys in Germany, who had done a video for a band that did a German cover of One of Us. Um, an amazing, and for, and first of all, an amazing cover. It was kind of like mariachi with mm -hmm. horns in German. And um, uh, the video was amazing. It was all these 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 old um, video film and video clips from the, from like the 30s that they had synced up with it. And um, so I contacted them, and it was that was their idea to do it that way. And, oh, and cool. you know they had they you know the the the, uh, the the classroom in India they got that the guy in the ski gondola. Um, well, a lot well of describe the video for for our listeners. Ah. Well, it's basically a bunch of different people singing the song. Um, we, you know, we solicited, you know, have, having our fans send in video clips of them singing it. Um, you know, I got my father in it. My, my, my kids are at one of my, one or two of my kids are in it. My wife's in it. Um, uh, everybody in the band is in it though. Barely. I mean, we, we, you don't see any of us until the guitar solo. I don't think where we, where it goes to live, but it was, yeah, nice. it was really, I think Bon Jovi did it like a month later. <laughs> they copied your video they copied our video that's great man bastards bastards well um all right so let's let's hit the last couple of questions here um they're both hypothetical this one imagine yourself in a strange land starting all over with this and you needed to start with a simple setup to re record with you needed to find people to make music with and then you needed that job so that you could survive what would you choose to do or what advice would you have to somebody who's you know, maybe faced with those decisions now. Well, dude, I'm doing it. All right. Well, tell us, tell us what I'm you're doing. I'm doing it. I, I moved to Stockholm in, in July. Um, and I have right in front of me what I'm, I'm doing this interview through. I have my, my MacBook, 
I have my Apollo Twin. I have my one good mic. I've got my little Akai keyboard. I've got a couple of electric guitars, an acoustic guitar, a mandolin, and a little three-quarter size Gretsch bass, and um, a bunch of gigabytes of, of live drums recorded in my computer. Nice. Um, and that's, that's how I'm working now. You know, I'm, I'm in a city that has more songwriters per capita than any in the world, except Nashville, of course, and I know a lot of people here, so I'm... But if you are arriving in a strange place... You just got to get out there, go to go to gigs, look at, uh, you know, Google recording studios, Google publishers, Google songwriters and introduce yourself to people and, you know, be prepared to bring your A game. Yeah. Good, good advice. Because, you know, they, they don't want you in the room just taking up space. They want, you know, they're, everybody's always looking for something new, something different, especially people who are in the songwriting business. You know, I don't consider myself to be in the songwriting business. Like I said, I'm a musician. To me, writing songs is a necessary evil. It's for me, it's just a reason to play a guitar solo. Right. <laughs> well, but, I, I liked your story of um, what if God was one of us too, because you sat down and you composed a whole song out of your instruments first before you ever even figured out how to sing it. And for somebody like me, it's always been easier to think that way. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of how I do everything. That's how I wrote I'm Alive, uh, for example. Um, you know, earlier, like All You Zombies was one that we we wrote in a room. You know, Rob was playing his, whatever keyboard he had, and uh, I was playing guitar, and we just started singing, and we made up a song. Um, and that, that still happens from time to time. There are some songwriters who still work that way, Desmond Child in particular. With him, you don't go near recording equipment until every lyric is finished. Interesting. But me, I'm, you know, I like to, I like to interface with the machines and get, you know, I need to be, my brain needs to be fooled into, into necessity, the mother of invention. Right. Oh, I like that. The mother, mother of invention. Um, that's just reminding me that I just had the honor to do an interview with Joe Ciccarelli, who oh, worked cool. with Frank Zappa, which of course is a reference to the mothers of invention. That's right. All right. So, um, and as far you any more comments you want to make on getting that job, making ends meet? Is it okay for somebody to deliver pizzas while they're making music, or do they need a job in music somehow? I think an outside job is helpful, honestly. And sometimes I wish I had one. In fact, I'm actually working at the music store around the corner now on Saturdays. Oh, cool, man! I like that. It you know, I go, I hang out there every day. Anyway, it's one of the coolest music stores in the world. It's called Hellstones. Um, on Sudermalm in, in Stockholm, he's got great vintage stuff, um, tons of everything, amazing drums. He's a, uh, uh, Sven is a, dr a drummer from, from way back. And I, I spend half my time hanging out there anyway. So he said, Hey, you know, nobody wants to work on Saturdays. You want to come in? I'm like, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. That's great. So I go and I tune the guitars because they were all out of tune. And I think when someone picks up a guitar for the first time, first impression is very important. Guitar should be in tune. That's good advice. I like that. Um, all right. So let's, let's jump to the final one. We're going to take the way back studio machine and you're going to go back in time, find young Eric, um, I guess in Philadelphia and tap yourself on the shoulder. You turn around and say, Holy smokes, old Eric, who looks so young still, what are you doing here? And you say, well, I've come to give you this one right. bit of advice. Here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the recording studio yourself one day. What would you tell yourself? Smile. <laughs> cool, man. Do you think that that was because you weren't smiling as much back then? I think I didn't smile because um, I took advice from people who said, hey, man, you shouldn't smile so much. It's way cooler, you know. You, to, you know, it was the 80s. Oh, right, the band photos where everybody's it, just got it, that, that nonplussed look on their face. And it's just like, oh, my God, what was I thinking? And, and I knew better. The same thing with, the, you know, the hairspray and the, the, the clothes. I'm like, okay, I guess this is what we're doing now. But, oh, man, I, I'd rather be wearing my jeans. And, you know. But, um, <laughs> but and even, even in my vocals, it's like it's so overwrought. Um, you know, smile, relax, have fun. That's great, man. Have fun. That's why we do this. You know, people, we, we, we don't get paid for the work we do. I mean, we have to do the work we do, but what we're getting paid is we're getting paid to have fun. You don't get paid for pouting. No, you don't get paid for pouting. 
<laughs> I mean, well, I guess, I guess maybe some people, some people do. do. <laughs> some people do, but, but you know, for me anyway, I've, I've never done anything to make money and made money. I've done shit for fun and that's been successful. I mean, look, I write a song for my new girlfriend. Um, I write a wacky song with, you know, with, with, with God and Jesus and a, and a schmuck on a bus. And, you know, 23 years later, um, I, I'm, I'm doing interviews about it. They're still doing TV programs about it. And I'm not living entirely off of that song, but that song has made me not have to deliver pizzas. Yeah. Some weird guy with too much beard is, you know, calling you from East Nashville, Tennessee and asking you questions about it <laughs> in 2017. And I never had more fun than I had writing that song and nor recording it. Even, even the, even the, I don't know if you we're going to, we're already over here, but I'm going to, if you're still, okay, I'll tell you the story of tracking that song. Sure. So we, we did that album in a house in uh, upstate New York. We rented a house. Um, Jeff Gate Day King set it up for us. We had a Studer, an A800, uh, tracked through a couple of Neves, a bunch of Jeff's prototype EQs, um, uh, a bunch of good mics. And, um, you know, we, we cut, tried to get as much live as we could. And, um, that was the last track that we did. And we tried a few times and it, it just wasn't feeling right. And when, um, we had a great drummer, we had Andy Kravitz playing drums, who was really just masterful. Nice. And, but it just wasn't, it felt too slick. It felt too this, too that. And Rob, you know, was playing Wurlitzer on it. He said, let me give it a shot. He sits down, I start the song, and it was it just happened. And we got to the solo, and I had been playing the rhythm part through the solo, thinking I'd overdub it. I just I clicked on the on the rat, and I went for it. Ah, uh, that's great, man. And um, we ended up the, the, getting the vocal. It's a whole other other story. But but that track was magical. And that was Rob yeah. playing drums. That was the first time he'd, he'd ever recorded, been recorded on drums. That's great. And the drums were very simple too. And, and that's, I think, what made it all work for me is hearing that song and being reminded how um, simple and raw the attitude of the song was. And I think at that time, it probably helped it, you know, hit a home run with the alt rock scene of the yeah. the 90s like that. And it's funny because Rick kept asking me, is there some other presentation for the song, you know, something a little more exotic, a little more ethnic, because, you know, that's what we were going for in most of the album. And I was like, dude, alternative rock is king right now. This is an opportunity for us to intersect with what's actually happening. Uh, let's just do it this way. Nice. Which was the right, was the, which was the right thing, you know. And another thing with that track is that the guitar playing on that, that is, that's probably the best representation of who I am as a musician. That's with cool. that guitar playing on that, it's like, if I could just do that all day, I'd be a happy guy. That's cool, man. Well, Eric, I think we're ready to wrap up on the podcast here. Thank you so much for joining us on Recording Studio Rockstars. Can I ask you for a closing chord or two on the guitar? And then while you're doing that, can you let the listeners know how they can find you online and learn more about you? Okay. Hi, that's the C major seventh chord, which the Beatles called the girl E C because they didn't know what a major seventh was. <laughs> That's a D7, which they did use a lot and probably knew what that was called. My name is Eric Bazilian. I'm doing this podcast with Elijah Shaw. Is it Lige or Lidge? Lidge, Lidge. Lidge rhymes with fridge because I'm cool I like know. that, which is just a terrible joke, but it, you'll never forget it now. See, I thought it was Lige, like from Elijah. It's where it but, comes from. It's, it's derived from my full name, Elijah. And actually, at first I thought it was a girl because Lee, L-I-J, is a girl's name in Sweden. Well, I'd probably be better looking if I was, but... Um, not with the beard, I don't think. No, that's true. That's probably not true. Anyway, so, so I'm, I, I digress. Okay. Hi, this is Eric Bazilian, and you are listening to my very long and very detailed interview with Lid Shaw on his amazing Recording Rockstars podcast. And you can find me... Mm, there's a Twitter at Eric Bazilian. There's an Instagram called Eric Bazilian. There's a Facebook account called Eric Bazilian. I think there's a second one, but you'll be able to tell which one that is that I haven't looked at in five years. Uh, there's a website that I haven't updated since 2013, but ask around. Wikipedia is pretty accurate. 
Um, and if you want to get in touch with me, there's an email address on the website. Nice, man. Well, I appreciate that with a name like Bazillion, you have one social media handle. That's smart. <laughs> All right, cool, Eric. Thanks so much, man. I can't wait to meet you in person. Uh, I don't know if it'll be in Philadelphia or Sweden. Uh, I actually just or received, Nashville or in Nashville. Yeah, I received an email this morning with an invitation to potentially come out to Sweden to um, teach and do a lecture at a university there. So I hope really? that comes together. Yeah, I can't tell What's you more about it because I don't know anything more about it yet. Oh wow! What, you know you don't know which university. I don't even know. Nope it's a it's a student that I've worked with here in the past. I've actually done a workshop here for a number of years with the music school of Patea, Sweden, which is up north. And, oh, um, Piteå. Yeah, Piteå. Oh my god, that's yeah. that's where I was on my way to when I met my wife. Oh, cool, man! Great, great school and great program, and it's been a blast. Um, I really enjoy working with the Swedish students when they've come here to to record music. I am actually an honorary citizen of PTO. I bet it's cold there too. Right about now, it's really cold. It's really cold here. Christ Almighty! What What's was the I temperature? Um, it was four degrees Celsius when I walked in. And, four and degrees Celsius. Okay, so zero is 30, freezing. About eight degrees. Uh, about forty. Okay, all right. You know, that's about what it is here. Well, yep. rock stars, oh. thanks so much for listening. Eric, thanks for being on the show, and I, we'll see you around the studio, dude. Rock and roll. Cheers, man. A pleasure. Take care. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music.